Okay, so we are back here. It is day two. And uh, so, first of all, we all have to practice the two W's. I've been staying up all night last night. Come on, you guys can do this. You got to do this. If you don't do this, you don't know how to get on CCAT. I've already figured this out. Not, it's like this. <laughs> See? <laughs> there are people having trouble this morning. There's alcohol flowing in this room. Okay. <laughs> If, if you go to the barbecue tomorrow, you'd be late. She's just trying to get more for herself. We're going there this afternoon. <laughs> I'm just telling you. So anyway, we got the W down. Listen, I think the, uh, the important thing, there were some comments made yesterday. The administrative stuff is still the same. The bathrooms are still in the same place. Uh, the break is still in the same place. The vendors are over there in the same place. Uh, so we don't need a lot of administrative announcements. But what we do need to do is talk a little bit about yesterday to kind of think about what we're going to do today. And when you think about what we were talking about yesterday, and when you listen to Colonel Atkins talk about um, where they were going and what this means, okay, it's not just the W's. It's the fact that they are focused on the warfighter and everything else will follow that. And that's a pretty strong message when you stop and think about it. So that um, CCAD uh, and industry, are going to continue to have partnerships. There are people that are struggling as the Army, not just CCAD, but as the Army changes and relooks itself and looks at how do I have to be prepared today, but still invest in the future for tomorrow. And so techniques that are being used today at CCAD will not necessarily be the same techniques that are used five, ten years from now or even a year from now, or a couple of months from now, when she was talking about how they're doing the cold spray and some other things. So it's going to change. And as industry that's part of this big aviation enterprise, we have got to think about how do we contribute to that? How do we make her and the team here successful so that the folks that we put in harm's way are successful and we bring them home? Um, we had Bill Marriott in. And uh, I, I thought his pitch was great yesterday, talking about strategic depth. If you're looking for his charts, you're not going to get his charts. He was very clear about that. He wanted to come here. He wanted to share that with you. But there is data on those charts that, if mixed with other data, can make some real conclusions that we don't want everybody making. Okay, it was talking about readiness rates and it was attributing it to components. So that's why he did not make his charts public. Okay, but you heard what he had to say. Strategic depth is critical. And he talked about it in terms that even a guy like me can understand uh, in terms of baseball, being on the team, knowing your number uh, and the rest. Um, I will say that after um, uh, much of this, we then went into um, uh, Don Nitty, and we got into some more specifics. We got a little deeper in the details, and then we went into the CCAD readiness panel. Uh, great panel. What I heard was, man, I had a bunch of questions. You know, uh, I wish I'd had a chance to ask them, uh, and I hope a lot of those got asked during the breaks because they're critical, and how we look at CCAD and the readiness and the rest is huge. And then last night, um, we, we talked about the, the people part of this business and how are we training those people, how are we preparing those people, where are we going to find them and recruit them, and what are the different things. And we all recognize that uh, the population is different, the skills that are coming in are different, that there are some circles that will say if your child starts in high school, by the time they get to college, Whatever their job they were looking at will have changed. And so how do you set up the critical skill path that's necessary to be successful in life? Um, and then, of course, we took an operational unit at, earlier in the day, uh, the 160th, and we said, how does the 160th tie into this, and how do we share, and how do we go back and forth? So it wasn't just, you know, what do I look like? I look like a cab. How am I different? I am different. How do they take and pass technology to the rest of the conventional force? And they do that all the time because they're a test bed on emergency tests. Uh, but they're a, they're a real world test bed 
that when they put it on, a, on an aircraft, they're going into harm's way that day. And they're going with what they've got. And then we look at it and say, can it, in fact, be transitioned to the rest of the force? But he's also got a big plan and connection between CCAD and the, and the unit. And the young Loose Award winner yesterday, Sergeant Renth, is an example of that, of how he's been trained and how he has been able to go back into the unit and make a real difference about putting operational capability back in the field quickly because he's been trained by CCAD and he's also been trained by another, a number of uh, commercial outside organizations. So all in all, I thought yesterday was great. Um, if you did not get enough at the... Um, Social last night to eat, it's your own fault because I guarantee I got at least five pounds of uh, roast beef left. So that was all good. But I think we had a great day yesterday. Uh, and we are absolutely fortunate that Colonel Atkins and her team have been able to come out here and spend as much time as they have. And ma'am, to you, I will tell you that talking to the folks in industry, they cannot thank you all enough for the interaction that they've had in the other room. Uh, about people that are truly interested in what their products are, how can they help, and how can they help you. So um, so with that, I'm going to open up the professional sessions this morning, and I'm going to bring up Brigadier General Howard Yellen, um, and he's going to go up and he's going to conduct the OEM Futures Panel for Industry Perspective on what the future holds for Army Aviation Sustainment. So Howard, at that, you and your panel, please. Well, good morning to every, everybody out there. Can you hear me okay? There we go. Yeah, it looks like everybody's still streaming in a little bit. I hope everybody had a, a good evening here in Corpus Christi last night. You know, yesterday, <clears throat> General Munt, using a baseball metaphor, kind of threw me a high and tight fastball uh, about, about my, uh, my beloved team. And then this morning, threw a, kind of a hard slider in the dirt. And the only thing I can say is for all of you Astro fans and New York Yankee fans that might be out there, there is good news on the horizon. It's only 115 days till pitchers and catchers report to spring training. And uh, there, there, there is hope uh, next year's ALCS. Uh, there will not be a, uh, a wiffle ball team from New England playing in the ALCS. <laughs> Uh, I'm honored again to, to chair the OEM Futures Panel. I have a group of uh, distinguished panelists here to my right, your left. I'm going to you know, introduce them first, make a, a comment or two, and then uh, turn it over to them uh, so they can get right into it. Uh, to my right, uh, Mike Bowen from Boeing. Uh, he's a retired Air Force officer. He's the director of Attack Helicopter Sustainment, and he's based in uh, Mesa, Arizona. Uh, his organization supports Apache units uh, worldwide with sustainment and services, and he provides Boeing support uh, right here at CCAD. Uh, next to him is Harry Nahadis. He's with GE Aviation. Harry's the vice president for turboshaft and turboprop programs. He's responsible for developing, delivering, and supporting all these engines for US military, international military, and commercial operations. We were supposed to have Rod Hines here today for Honeywell. Unfortunately, Rod had a family emergency and could not get out yesterday. He sends his uh, sincere apologies. I spoke with him last night. He's doing well, family's doing well, and uh, we wish him the very best. He was, he's a return uh, panelist for this particular panel. Uh, I know he'd look forward to being here next year. Uh, Jay Macklin is, it will be next. He's with uh, Sikorsky, a Lockheed Martin company. Uh, Jay's a 26-year Army aviator uh, retiree. Uh, he's Sikorsky's Army and Air Force Aftermarket Business Development Senior Manager, and he's located in Huntsville, Alabama. He works closely with AMCON as well as the uh, UH Program Office on both aftermarket support concepts and execution of UH-60 uh, sustainment. He also performs a similar role uh, in support of the Air Force. And last but certainly not least at the very end there, we've got Bill Smith. Smithy's from uh, Parker Hannafin Corporation. Uh, he's the director of military aftermarket business, op uh, excuse me, business development, customer support operations, and in this position, he's responsible for directing all military aftermarket business opportunities for customer support operations and across all aerospace divisions within uh, Parker Hannafin. 
He joined Parker in 2005 after serving 20 plus years in the United States Air Force. So we have a, a good mix here of Army aviation experience as well as Air Force aviation experience. I asked the, uh, the panelists as we were starting to put this together to take a look in the future. And what I didn't want to do uh, is I want to stay away from the typical uh, OEM business development type brief. You know, here, here's our uh, marketing uh, materials. Here's what we're doing. We all know we all these are you know extraordinarily well known companies who've been in the uh, Army aviation, Air Force aviation, Naval aviation, and Marine aviation for many years. Uh, they've been you know they're uh, well known, well renowned uh, OEMs. What I wanted them to do is take a little look, uh, a little bit more into into the future. Look out three, five, ten years. Uh, what is what is their company doing? Uh, for future of Army aviation, uh, specifically focused on sustainment operations. Uh, you may remember last year, and I know on many of his briefings, General Gabram, the AMCOM commanding general, talks about sustainment being his number one priority, and one of his goals is to reduce sustainment costs. And uh, I think that's an effort that all the OEMs are pursuing, and I think you'll, you'll hear more from each of these four members uh, today. So that's kind of what we're going to take a look at uh, this panel, is uh, what are these OEMs doing in the future uh, to, in support of Army aviation <laughs> sustainment, and how are we looking to you know, insert technology over the next three, five, or even ten years, even beyond that, to keep this fleet uh, aloft. So, Mike, I'll start with you. Okay. Uh, good morning. Uh, Colonel Atkins, for the record, I and the entire Boeing team are here to support the warfighter. And, uh, and I wanted to mention one thing, General Munt, you, you talked yesterday and you were speculating that we were probably going to uh, have to maintain these platforms uh, you know, for 40 years, and it kind of reminded me of uh, my early, early days uh, as a kid. I was five years old and I lived on Griffiths Air Force Base, which was an old Air Force Strategic Air Command base, and my dad was a B-52 aircraft mechanic, and it was a memorable time for me because I think I learned how to ride a bike, throw a baseball, and I also remembered my dad constantly being out on the ramp getting B-52s ready to, to do whatever they needed to do for, for, the, for the Air Force. And then fast forward, 25 years later, I'm a major. Uh, I'm about 200 feet off the ground on final flying into Griffiths Air Force Base with the base commander. And I look down and all I see is a sea of B-52s. And I commented to the base commander, I said, hey, you know, my, my old man used to work on the, you know, on B-52s here at Griffiths Air Force Base. And he said, yeah, those are the same airplanes. <laughs> so, uh, so it just goes to show that, and, and they're probably still there. So I, I, think, uh, I think from Boeing's perspective, we, we, we're pretty sure we'll be, uh, we'll, we'll be maintaining these Apaches that we're cranking off the production line uh, for, for another 40 years, as you speculated yesterday. Let's see, does this, okay, here we go. Um, I, I also uh, wanted to, to just say, for, you know, in trying to evaluate how do we lower the sustainment costs, uh, you know, both in the past and the future, let me talk about the past a little bit first, and then I'll, and then I'll talk about what, what I think we're, where we're going in the future. Um, you know, we're, we're proud to have, you know, 30 to 40 Boeing personnel down here. We've been down here, you know, uh, working on the TELS contract since 2004. So next year, as the TELS uh, contract sunsets, we'll have been down here for 15 years and got a lot of got a lot of good experience down there. And probably most proudest and most recently, we've been proud of of being able to help CCAD, you know, return crash battle damaged aircraft back to the warfighter. And I think we did. Uh, we helped the CCAD team here do five in six months, which is, I think, a world record at the time. So pretty proud about that. We've, we've also participated, I think, in the last Chinook that came through. Uh, and, and, and I think in the, in the process of us uh, setting up our, our supply chain to help uh, CCAD support their operations of both depots, both the components and the aircraft, I think we've, we've turned in you know, I validated tens of millions of dollars of engineering savings and, and you know, and managing the surplus inventory. So I think those are two important functions here at CCAD that, uh, that, that keeps, keeps going. Um, you know, when we look at, when we look at what we've done, uh, we, we've, we, 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 we help in both supplying the parts for, uh, you know, the component repair and overhaul. And, and I think the big point where where Boeing will will has in the past and will continue in the future to help is remember, you know, the Army has the advantage because we have two active production lines. We've got an active production line in Philadelphia we, uh, for the Chinooks. 
We've got an active production line in Mesa, pumping out uh, six to eight Apaches a month. And, and that gives us a lot of flexibility. If you, if you consider uh, you know, the, the Air Force Depot counterparts where they're trying to maintain F-15s and F-16s that are no longer uh, really in, in active production, you know, uh, acquiring uh, spare parts and component repair is more challenging. And so this gives us, I think, you know, a, a, an ability to support CCAD uh, uh, more than, more than you, you would imagine. Um, and, and then in the course of, of uh, working our, our uh, tell support to the CCAD here in the past, uh, you know, we've been able to do logistics and material management, flight test support, you know, structural engineering, and a lot of engineering reach back because one thing Boeing prides itself is that we've got, we've got a very, very strong engineering bench, uh, both, both back in Mesa and, and in Philadelphia to help with uh, all the component uh, repairs and, and overhauls that are going on here. We'll continue that in the future uh, because we plan on cranking out uh, Chinooks and Apaches for, for a long time and have some pretty robust multi-year contracts you know, to ensure that we'll be doing this in the decades ahead, which is, which is pretty exciting to us. Um, and then, and then uh, Howard asked us to say, well, what about the future? How are we going to help the army lower the sustainment costs because because as howard pointed out that you know that is uh general gabrin's number one priority and as i was explaining to colonel atkins uh, late yesterday um we boeing is certainly part of the new paradigm of going from two two visits a year by general gabrin to weekly visits by general gabrin and so we've uh in in and in, in had some uh, challenges on the apache program and so uh i think we've we've we own this uh, paradigm of how do you lower the sustainment cost and go from a just-in-time delivery system, which we operate on a production line, to some sort of strategic depth. And so one, one change that, that uh, Boeing's made about a year ago that I think is relevant and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, kind of gives us a vector for where we can see, find some savings in the future is, Boeing used to be two companies used to be a big commercial aircraft company based in Seattle and a big defense company based in St. Louis. And, and those two, uh, both those two businesses had services uh, attached to them as sub-business units. And about a year ago, our, our CEO decided it's time, it's time to break out the services part of both the commercial aircraft and the defense uh, companies into a single business unit called Boeing Global Services. And the reason he did that is because both of, both of those are, are clearly important. I mean, as you can imagine, on the commercial side, you know, we pump out a lot of 737s and 787s a month, and each of those have an, an, has an opportunity for sustainment because, like the warfighter, you know, aircraft availability to a commercial airline operator is key. It's the only way they make money. And so what we've done is we've pulled out the, the services part of the Boeing commercial company and the services part out of the defense company and merged those together. The, the hope and the vector for the entire leadership of Boeing Global Services is to drive whatever synergy there is between what the commercial guys do and what the defense guys do and figure out how do we you know, cross-pollinate cross all those good lessons learned we've, got, we've received from supporting the warfighter as well as the commercial airline operator. So time will tell. Uh, that's the hypothesis of the organization, and I think, uh, I think it's starting to pay off in dividends as we cross-pollinate both of those big companies. Um, the other thing, the other way I think in the future that we we can help lower the sustainment cost is, is you know, as, as I'm sure every person here that works for CCAD knows is supply chain is everything. And to a defense company like Boeing, supply chain is everything. You know, they, they'll drive your schedule. And, and if there's a way you can optimize the supply chain across across an entire platform, that's the way I think we're going to lower, lower uh, sustainment costs. And, and we have the advantage of, of being out there trying to support uh, every Apache unit out there uh, from our, within our PBL contracts that we have to support the different Apache units out there. We've got 15 different international customers for the Apache. Uh, most, of, uh, most of those customers have selected some, some type of 
performance-based logistics or post-production support contracts. So we're doing component overhauls for those platforms too. And then our experience with CCAD, when you put all those together, if you can somehow optimize the supply chain for all of those, those different customers as well as the production line, it gives all of us infinite flexibility to be able to you know, uh, exchange between all those different customers and, and keep the warfighter flying. And so I think in the future, the, the more we can drive you know, an integrated supply chain between CCAD, the Army customer, and Boeing, I think, I think we'll, we'll see uh, those dividends. And then I think, as I, as I mentioned, we do have the advantage of having a rather large performance-based logistics arrangement with the Army where we, we basically have uh, field, field service representatives and logistics support representatives in vir with virtually every Apache battalion out there. We've been doing this for uh, a little over a decade, and so far we've been able to exceed the supply availability dates, uh, the su supply availability rates, uh, material uh, requirements, and reliability baselines through those for, for all those customers. And I think, you know, the fact that we we do have this big big contract that that, uh, that is going to be synergistic with what's going on here at CCAD and help us lower the sustainment cost in the future, like we have been in the past. And then the final few things that I think uh, we you know are going to be in our favor for trying to lower some of these sustainment costs is is you know, as the Army rotates to D DLA to get a lot of the support requirements, we're in lockstep. Uh, we were one of the first companies to have a, what's, what's called a DLA Captains of Industry contract, which basically gives us tremendous scope for Boeing legacy platforms to be able to, to, or, uh, to supply spare parts to all of these, these different customers. And so in this contract, it's really reduced the, the, what, what we all know is the contract's churn. It takes forever to get a lot of these things on contract. With this DLA Captains of Industry contract, it's, it's, a, t it's a 10 year, uh, multi-billion dollar ceiling contract with basically any, any scope of any Apache or Chinook part or any other Boeing platform will fit in there. And it allows you guys to be able to order these on the spot without that acquisition lead time eating into our, our readiness levels. And then, and then one thing for the future that we'll have to, as we sunset the TELS contract, one of the big things that I think has been an advantage is the sharing of data, uh, utilization data between our PBL contract, the TELS contract, what's going on here at CCAD. That's one thing that we have to do in the future is we have to figure out a way to share that data so that we have the best forecasting for both the, the CCAD mission here as well as, as the Boeing mission to support all these. And then, and then in addition, we, got, we have to also make sure we, we figure out how to share you know, the engineering and operations. Because as I said, if, you, you know, if you've taken a walk through the CCAD uh, operation here, and you've taken a walk through the Mesa or the Philadelphia depot repair and overhaul, you, you know, you'll find a lot of, of, of similar operations, if not the exact same operations. And so I think the key is that we got to stay partnered up in a long-term relationship down the road to make sure we can we can cross-pollinate these. So in closing, and I think we all understand that uh, even though you buy an Apache or Chinook, that's a that's a spot uh, 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 event, and and maybe 30% of the life cycle cost of the weapon system, 70% of that life cycle cost is in the sustainment. And so anything we can do to lower the sustainment cost is going to is going to pay big dividends and and then for, for on the apache side in particular the conops make sustainment ch challenging they don't all go to one big forward operating base and sit there they deploy in in twos and three ship formations to forward operating bases you got to figure out how to get the sustainment out there to to the pointy end of the spear and and i want you guys all to remember that you know boeing has focused an entire business now on trying to lower the sustainment costs for both the warfighter and the, and the commercial operator. And I think, remember, uh, a big advantage to this whole equation is that, remember, we have active production lines going, and that, that's going to enable us to, to try to drive those, those uh, costs down. So, and then finally, you know, having a tight relationship between the Army, uh, DLA, and Boeing are, are, is going gonna, is, is gonna to serve us well to, to, uh, to have a close partnership for the future. So appreciate the time to talk to the group here, and uh, we'll take any questions later in the presentation.
Thank you, Mike. Excellent briefing and uh, very informative. Uh, Harry, you're up. Sure. Thank you. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Quad A and, and General Munt for uh, hosting this uh, conference and for uh, and to CCAD and Colonel Atkins for, for hosting us here at, at uh, Corpus Christi and also to General Yellen for inviting me back to participate uh, in the panel. Uh, I'm a little tired because I was up late, late last night too watching, uh, watching my beloved Red Sox uh, <laughs> pound on uh, LA, but uh, I'll do my best here on the panel. Okay, so we have a minority of two now here <laughs> watching the Red Sox. So I've got one chart. Let's see if I can figure out how to flip it. Uh, Harry, you may not be invited back next oh, year. Oh, sorry. <laughs> just, just make this a good one. Is it the side one? Yeah, okay. So I have one chart because uh, I really wanted to have a, this be more of a dialogue than, than uh, uh, a lecture, if you will. Um, you know, and this chart really speaks to what we're currently doing with the depot. And, and uh, you know, in addition to these initiatives, we also supply, we're the supply chain, so we supply uh, in direct contract with the depot, the parts. But in terms of the initiatives that we work uh, on a continuous basis with the depot under a TELS contract, uh, similar to what Boeing uh, has, is, uh, you know, we work together with the depot to reduce turnaround time. And uh, reducing turnaround time allows you to increase throughput in the depot. It allows you to reduce the work and process, so now you can have more spare engines available uh, to improve readiness. So, uh, so we spend a lot of time working with the depot uh, figuring out ways to reduce our turnaround times, uh, as well as obviously having parts on hand when they need them, is also a key factor in reducing turnaround time. So uh, accurate forecast induction, uh, work scoping, and uh, sharing best practices with some of our overhaul shops that do similar work is uh, something we do on a regular basis with CCAD. Uh, second, we work with CCAD's engineering, our DCOM, uh, uh, to develop data-driven repair. So taking a look at what the results are of the engine operating in the field, looking at the, uh, the condition of the hardware and developing repairs in conjunction with the, with the depot to address some of the, some of the distresses that we see in the parts uh, to minimize the cost so they don't have to buy brand new parts, they can just repair uh, the parts that they see. So looking at leading indicators, participating in that with the depot hand in hand uh, is something we do on a daily basis. And then, and then lastly, working with the depot on improving depot operations, sharing our best practices, bringing the depot folks uh, to Struther, bringing our Struther people to, to the depot, uh, bringing the depot folks to some of our other commercial overhaul shops, uh, trying to work together with the depot to, again, uh, improve turnaround time, uh, improve depot productivity and efficiency, and improve ultimately improve readiness for the warfighter. And, and what I would offer is, is as we look forward in the future, there are, I'll say, three key technologies that we're all going to have to uh, embrace or not, uh, and that's, that's subject to the discussion. So number one, there, there's increasingly amount of data available to us and analytics available to us. Uh, Mike also talked about that. Uh, GE is very big into that, especially in our commercial space, in terms of rather than reacting, getting more along the lines of predicting, so, so knowing that an engine that's coming in from the field, what's wrong with it so that the parts are ready when it gets there, that it can get through the depot much quicker. Uh, there are more and more tools, more and more data available uh, to facilitate that. And, uh, and so it gets, takes you from more of a reactive stance to a proactive and predictive maintenance plan. And so those things are available and, and to the extent that we work together with the depot to implement those is, is obviously subject to discussion. And, and, uh, but it is certainly something that we all ought to face into uh, in order to improve readiness for the warfighter. Second uh, key technology that's uh, coming down the pike is additive manufacturing. And, and that, that opens a whole host of uh, opportunities and challenges. Uh, you know, it, the, sort of the vision is, hey, now you don't need to buy a part, you just have to have a machine and some metal powder on hand and you can, you can make whatever part you need. And, and so working through that and how that would work or not work uh, is certainly an opportunity in front of us that we could work with the depot on, uh, on some kind of an arrangement to, uh, you know, not every part would make sense to, to make additively, but, but certainly there are some parts that, uh, that might make sense and how that arrangement would work is, is, would be a complicated thing to work out but it's a technology that's going to be available and, 
and potentially could again improve readiness for the warfighter. And so it's something that we probably shouldn't shouldn't uh, ignore. And then the third uh, technology, uh, I would just lump into the category of more technologically advanced engines. Uh, and so the newer engines that are that are coming down the pike. Uh, number one, have much longer life-limited parts. So the lives of the life-limited parts are, are triple or double uh, the current uh, engine. So uh, presumably the engines will stay on wing a lot longer. So you won't need as many uh, overhauls. The, the demand for overhauls will go down with these newer engines. And, uh, and at the same token, those engines will be better able to tell you what's wrong with it. So, so you won't have to do complicated troubleshooting. The engine will say, hey, this module needs repair or this component needs repair. And so you know, in the future, you'll be able to do much more targeted overhauls than, than you currently do. And what impact will that have on the partnership and, and working with the depot? So, so those are three, uh, three technologies that I think are worthy of discussion and, and how we would work together in the future and what type of an arrangement we would have. And then uh, lastly, in terms of challenge, uh, Mike brought it up, uh, you know, the, one of the major changes going forward, uh, the Army is moving toward having DLA supply all the parts. And so the challenge will be integrating, uh, really integrating DLA into our supply chain and, and uh, you know, releasing to need uh, versus releasing to contract. And so uh, that, that will be something that will have to get uh, sorted out and figured out how to, how to address that mechanism because, uh, you know, right now, given all the data, we're able to kind of react pretty fast in terms of what parts are needed or not needed at the depot. And uh, how, how the arrangement would work uh, with DLA is something that, that uh, I would suggest is a challenge and how we would work that out is uh, subject to more discussion. So those are the key uh, elements of uh, what I see going forward, uh, working with the depot in the future. And uh, we look forward to it. We think uh, it's a great partnership. I think we were the first uh, company to have a partnership with CCAD way back in uh, 2000 or 2001. And, uh, and we're very proud of how it's been working. And, and uh, we are uh, really dedicated to supporting the warfighter and proven readiness uh, all across the board. So. Thank you for uh, inviting me, General. Harry, no, my, my pleasure. I think uh, your, of your three uh, advanced technologies, I think the, the one that's most intriguing is the, the more technologically advanced engines of the future, because I think that's a goal that we all have in Army Aviation, is how do we keep these engines on wing longer? Uh, and you know, try not just to get to time between overhaul, but to get to exceed TBO times, increase them, and then go well beyond it. And uh, again, that's a significant driver for uh, redu you know, reduced sustainment costs. Thank right. you very much for being here today. Um, for Sikorsky, Jay, you're okay. up. Thanks. Everybody hear me? You weren't kidding about these lights. I mean, you're yeah. like <laughs> under interrogation here. Um, well, hey, uh, Germont, I thank you uh, for hosting this, and, uh, and Colonel Atkins, I appreciate it. It's always, it's always great to get back to Corpus. You, you learn something, uh, and this, this is a smaller show, but to me, I think it, it, the value is that you're, you're really engaged with the people at, at a smaller level, and you can walk out and have a sidebar, and it's not like standing in a big booth in Nashville with 100 people walking up. And hmm. uh, as we were talking at, you know, at AUSA, there's all craziness going on around us. But, uh, but I appreciate the opportunity to come up, and, uh, and we're, we're pretty excited, you know, about the future. And I have two slides, so one more than doubled Harry's. So, uh, but uh, I, I think it was very interesting yesterday, the, the comments uh, that Bill Marriott made and also Don Nitty made. And we, we meet with uh, General Gabram uh, every month. And, uh, and it, it, it's, I think what's very telling is you're going to see, I know at least the first three briefs, I'm not sure about the fourth one, but there's, there are trends here that everybody, these OEMs are, are telling the group. And I, I know I picked up on a couple of things. You know, tells uh, going away. I mean, we, we were the first, uh, we had a TELS contract 15 years at Corpus. We were the first one in the shoot that happened, just so happened that was the first one to uh, expire. I believe GE is the next one that's coming up. And, uh, and there were a lot of really hard lessons that were learned um, when you're providing a significant portion of the bill of material to support the depot and that, when you flip a switch, that moves to DLA. 
And it sounds, in theory, like that can be a pretty much a seamless transition, but it's really not. DLA uses multiple different sources uh, than, say, we did different sources. So, you know, you're not really sure in the transition what were we going to keep forecasting, you know, what are they, did they start forecasting, and, you know, it's a very complex, you know, uh, process. But I think the result of that uh, is some of these inhibitors that you've seen, uh, where you now have uh, DLA out there actively uh, trying to, to utilize their sources whose different quality standards and say an OEM, just different, not good or bad, just different. And, and then they struggle, uh, and then when, when a source does fall through, they come back to us. In industry, you know, we're measured by our inventory turns, just like the Army is. So don't keep a lot of things on the shelf unless you're, un unless you're under contract for. So this forecasting thing that was brought forward yesterday uh, that, that Mr. Marriott talked about is, is incredibly important uh, to industry. Uh, we have to forecast, you know, procure the material through our supplier, our, our buyers and our supply base, uh, and then that's got to be pushed into the, into the program for the, the component to be built or that component to be shipped down here to support Colonel Atkins. And so if you don't know it's coming, the order's coming, and you're in this transactional environment, reactive, I think is what Mr. Marriott discussed yesterday, you know, all of a sudden you receive a delivery order from DLA saying, I need 100 of these, and at best you're at, you know, production lead time, at best. Uh, and that's if you take away the administrative lead time of contracting. Mm -hmm. So you're at a real disadvantage when all of a sudden Colonel Atkin needs 50 widgets or aircraft don't get, you know, out of here, you know, next week. And, and so industry is at a severe disadvantage when you don't know. That's why I think that, that, that this, we, you know, we kind of call it joint item management uh, is so important. And the communication is like, is so important. And as TELS does go away, um, we got to look to the future and try to figure out different ways that we can try to you know, if, if we're going to be in this transactional, this transactional relationship, um, we've got to be very clever in, uh, and use, you know, all the, the different contracting methods that are out there. And I, I think, you know, Mike did bring up the captain of industry, which we're, we're actively working with DLA as well, because DLA doesn't like it when they're having an answer to General Gabram either as to why they can provide a part. Uh, and so and they come to us, we look at each other, and we're at production lead time. So it is imperative that we be linked uh, with CCAD to understand, you know, the forecast, understand what, you know, what component repair needs that the depot has, what recap needs, so we can accurately get ahead of the bow. I think the term shoot behind the duck yesterday, and there, there's a lot of truth in that. Um, so, so one way, so say how do you fix it? And, you know, Howard asked us to talk about, you know, kind of the future. So if you go to the next, oh, I, yeah, I t talk to myself here, okay. Um, so really, you know, if we're not going to have a TELS contract, what's, what's the next best thing? Next best thing is, is to partner, you know, with the depot. And, uh, and I, I got to give Colonel Atkins a lot of credit. She stepped right up to the plate. She took command, and we, we, have, we have taken off uh, discussing ways to do this. You know, and I think that the, the key to this really is, is, you know, we're taking advantage of what the depot does really well. You know, like their artisans. You know, their artisans are, are world class. They fix things that are put in front of them. But if the artisan doesn't have the right part at the right time at the right place, he can't fix it. And so what, is, what does industry do pretty well? Well, with a lot of lead time and a lot of, you know, uh, you know understanding of the supply base and demand schedules and forecasting, we're pretty good at, at worldwide supply chain. Uh, and I will tell you that, you know, another point I think that most people don't think of is we're, we're probably going to be, we're going to deliver the last uh, Mike Model Blackhawk. I mean, there's debates on when that's going to be the last multi-year 10, maybe 2025 to 2027, depending on congressional plus ups, a lot of, a lot of interesting things. But if you think about, you know, we're delivering parts uh, for the, the Blackhawk because we have, you know, the Blackhawk is still in production. It is something different to think about when your aircraft is out of production. Because if you think about supply bases, what are they looking for, suppliers? They're looking for steady stream, predictability, you know, and there's a lot of FVL, there's things coming up, you know, in the future. I think suppliers are looking for what's the next best thing. 53K is going to be built up in Stratford. So they're going to want to get on those programs that got long legs. So, you, you know, you got to go back out to that Blackhawk supply base and say, look, you're going to be flying these aircraft till 2070. 
and, and these parts that are, that are being used here uh, and at our commercial repair facility are in, are in absolute need. So we have to take this serious. We have to really look at this long-term and strategically. You know, a transactional, you know, need-based, you know, approach to sustainment is extremely difficult. A lot of things have to come together at the right place at the right time so that part just hits at the right time. You know, the contracting, the lead times, the forecasting, depot overhaul factors, I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a hundred things that have to happen for that part. It's a miracle anything gets there, you know. Um, so there's some challenges. But you know, we think by teaming, you know, with the depot on, uh, on some key programs, I think that it, it enables, you know, us to, to have that predictability that we can translate back out to our supply base. It enables, you know, an item that, that, that maybe the, the depot and AMCOM is struggling with providing a lot of those piece parts. You know, we can dive into that. And another point that was made yesterday I thought was pretty interesting, uh, which we've told General Gabram, I think Bill Marriott said it very well, is that, you know, say that a widget doesn't get to Colonel Atkins and she can't produce the number of gearboxes that, that she was required to produce. Well, then AMCOM will turn around to us and say, okay, well, we need whatever she couldn't produce, 10 more repaired by Sikorsky. And we're mm -hmm. like, okay, well, you know, we're all competing for the same piece <clears throat> parts to repair that. It's not like she stopped repairing hers and all of a sudden there's more parts. So you're, we're really connected, you know, and, uh, and you've got to have these team, these teaming agreements and look at these problems uh, holistically. And, and I would hope, I would really hope that, that a lot of the lessons that we learned because we're about a year out of tells now, that I would really hope that, that AMCOM is applying those lessons to GE and then, and then on to Boeing, because uh, there were some hard lessons learned, and, and the result is, I mean, it's a supply chain issue. That's the result. So I'm hoping that, that our, you know, our, uh, our brothers at DLA are taking a look at that at AMCOM as well. Um, uh, okay, so, and then the other way I think that, uh, that, that I think we can kind of get ahead of this is, well, by ending, nope. So one thing that I think Sikorsky does, does really well across our, our other PBLs and our commercial total assurance programs, I mean, we're supporting, you know, these are power by the hour type uh, programs where, a, you know, a, a guy flying an aircraft out in the North Sea, I mean, he goes out and cranks. I mean, you know, we don't get paid unless that aircraft cranks. So we have a significant, uh, you know, amount of uh, advanced analytics that we apply towards towards, you know, why the component is breaking, what is the efficiency, how do you, what is the most efficient way to sustain that aircraft, you know, how do you, you know, for the maintenance cycles, for trend analysis on, you know, what procedures are being used, you know, you can actually see when someone is repairing an item, if they're going down the wrong decision tree, I'll remember those in the Army, uh, and, and maybe there's a better way to do it, and, and that's how we provide world-class service really to, to our customers out there. We don't really do a lot of this with the Army. Interestingly, it's a transactional based uh, and there's not a lot of data sharing. And, I, and, and we really believe <clears throat> as we're moving forward uh, that, that this is an area where we can, you know, really help the Army, both the depot and, and AMCOM, you know, feel like now we're ordering a lot of parts after something breaks. What if we were identifying something before it broke? You know, it's kind of some of the things Harry just kind of spoke about. Those are the real opportunities, the demand being driven down. Uh, so we're not just, you know, feeding the machine to repair more things, repair more things. Are we really looking at why it broke? You know, what, what happened? What, what could we break in that chain to prevent, prevent that gearbox from even breaking in the beginning? You know, and so there, there's real, uh, and we have real, you know, savings that we've been able to save the Navy. Uh, and, and, you know, the Air Force is taking a look at this and the Marine Corps you know, is utilizing this, and then again, our commercial customers. So we really think that, uh, that the key to sustainment is really in understanding and seeing yourself, and advanced analytics is how we go about it. And, uh, and it's something that I think that, that the Army uh, could really use, and we're looking forward to that. So again, I, I appreciate the effort, or the, uh, the time this morning. Uh, again, I learn something every time I come down here. Uh, it, it, it is uh, definitely one of the crown jewels of the Army and you understand how important it is to the Army. And uh, Sikorsky and Lockheed Martin are really committed to doing whatever we need to do to, to continue that. So thank you. Thanks, Jay. Thanks. And uh, for those who might not be aware, uh, at AUSA a few weeks ago uh, at the Black Hawk Breakfast, we celebrated the 40th anniversary of this iconic platform. And uh, 
I, I'm not, I would not be surprised if we see this platform around for another 40 years. Uh, uh, so uh, thank you very much, Jay, for, for being here this morning. Thanks. Bill and Parker Hannafin. Thank you, General. Thank you, everybody. Um, I'd like to start with General, I'm a Cleveland's fan, Cleveland Indians, Cleveland Browns, so I'm sticking with my motto that I have for the last 54 years, next year is our year. Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, so I feel your pain, General, uh, up front. Um, lived it, know it well. Supporting the customer, I'd like to start with a question for my panel of friends. Who's our customer? Right, so, you know, we sat down, the General said, hey, I want you to put together a presentation uh, but I don't want any of that BD garbage in there. Uh, I want it to be focused on something that, you know, will, will spur conversation, right? So really, and look at the future, three, five, 10 years. So who's our customer? So I'll start with General, if we could work our way down the panel. Who's our customer? General, who's your customer? Who's my customer? Who's your customer? The Army. Okay. For this symposium. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Next, who's your customer? Uh, the Army, the warfighter. Yep. Yeah, ultimately it's, it's the warfighter. Yeah. Yeah, ultimately the warfighter, that's it, who we, we support. And I would agree with all of them, right? I, I always say I work for the E4 at 8 o'clock on, on a Friday night, right? And, and people ask me, well, why do you say that? Well, usually about 8 o'clock on a Friday night, you're determining, am, am I going to work weekend duty? Do I have my supply posture? That's when all the illities come into the equation supportability, capability, reliability, uh, feasibility, all of those illities usually come into effect right around that time because then I'm deciding, am I gonna have to force that young technician to work the weekend? All right, so that's who I normally say, it's the warfighter who I work for. So what I'd like to do is to summarize and bring us all together is to start with a quick test. And you're all probably thinking, what the hell are you doing, Smitty? Um, it's very simple. It's a two-question test, so get out your pen and paper um, and, and get ready. Everybody ready? Seriously, here it comes after the overview. <laughs> okay, so in 15 seconds, connect all the nine dots using only four lines and not taking your pen or pencil off the paper. So I gave this test to our team. I gave it to our entire CSO customer support organization. And I asked them to do the same thing. Out of those nine dots, only four lines, not taking your pen or pencil off the paper, connect all nine dots. Okay. Critical point to the statement is don't take your pen or pencil off the paper. Okay, so that's your first question. You've had about 15 seconds, so hopefully you got it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Did you see that? Yeah. So what did you see? Write down what you saw. Did everybody see it? I'll do it again. Ready? Write down what you saw. Okay. Did you see it? Everybody need, anybody need to see it again? Raise your hand if you need to see it again. Okay. Let's look at the answers. And you'd be amazed how many people, when I gave it to our team, you know, thought, well, Smitty, what the heck are you doing? Why are you giving us this test? Well, what I wanted to prove, and I'm sure a lot of you have read many books that have seen this in your book, right? But a lot of people ultimately get tunnel visioned. I call it the engineer effect, right? They focus and they get so tunnel visioned on, well, he gave me four lines and nine dots and they try and stay inside the box, right? Some, sometimes we need to look outside the box to see the, the right answer, right? Sometimes we use the phrase, well, I've always done it that way. Well, is that the right way to do it? Yeah. I, I could tell you one of the key things that I picked up was I, I had a meeting with uh, General Mc, uh, McMahon up at OSD, and, and one of the things that he used was it was pretty, it was pretty unique. He said, Spinny, let me tell you something. Look at the Black Hawk. Look at the F-16. Look at your B-52. The mother of the last, of, of the, the, I'm sorry, the, the last aircraft that's going to fly to the boneyard to AMARG, the mother of that pilot is not born yet. So I had to sit back and think about that for a second. So the mother of the pilot that's flying that aircraft to the boneyard is not born yet. That's how long we're flying those planes. 
So when the general said, look at your three, your five, your 10 year future, where are we gonna be? We're gonna have the same platforms we have today, the same ones we had 10 years ago. When you look at historically and you look at the plan, our aging aircraft fleet doesn't start getting younger till 2032. Right? So sometimes we need to say, I've done it that way always, but was that always the right way? Right? Sometimes you need to look outside the box. For this one, a lot of people look at it and they assume that what they read was wrong and they know what the customer wanted to say. Sometimes it's right in front of us and we don't know how to read it, right? And that's why I always tell my, my peers, I always tell our team, right? What were the nonverbals? Did you read it incorrectly, right? Sometimes we don't listen, right? We have to hear what the customer is telling us, right? So anybody not pass the test? Raise your hand. Okay. Good morning. Thanks for having me. I'd like to start with a thank you, right? Um, Thank you to anybody that has served, is serving, or will serve, right? Because we have all served, and I appreciate what you're doing for our country. Who is Parker, right? Parker's, you know, a ginormous company, $14 billion, right? We make everything under the skin, and we're a tier one supplier for the three gentlemen sitting next to me, right? Um, but we have a Parker promise, right? I'm, I'm gonna make a promise to you, right? That through partnering, productivity, and profitability, because those three things have to go hand in hand, right? we will be successful, right? That's how we stayed in business for over 100 years. And so with that promise, things are gonna change. Things are gonna shift, right? DLA is gonna be a procuring agency since 2005 BRAC. We all kind of want, wow, what is this gonna look like? Good thing I just retired in 2005 because I didn't want to have to go through that transitional change while still wearing the uniform. Must have been tough. I could tell you it was tough for industry. It's still tough for industry, right? And we're still trying to figure out who's who in the zoo. Right? Again, I go back to all of our illities, right? Reliability, supportability, maintainability, capabilities. Um, and I look at those illities and I say, in the future, three, five, 10 years from now, where are we gonna be? We're still gonna need to be focusing on sustainability and sustaining the current platforms that our sons, daughters, brothers, sisters, friends are flying and working on. That's what we're gonna be, right? Again, we're working on new production, we're working on new platforms, we're working on new engines, but everything that's out there today is gonna to be out there in 10 years from now, right? So we need to look at supportability, sustainability of that product, right? And then that's how that brings into the Parker promise. So one of Parker's main goals, and this folds all the way down from our CEO, is no matter what the program, just so you know, I didn't do that. You saw my hand was right here. Yeah, you're, right? you're clean. I'm clean, thanks. Um, it, but I'm looking at uh, what is reliability? I guess the slide wanted me to skip it, right? So when we look at the age of the platforms, we already heard what the general, general told me when, uh, from OSD at AUSA. And, and we look at the Department of Defense letter that was just put out for uh, uh, the Secretary of Defense, and he listed some key programs, and then people are adding programs onto that. Right, um, and looking at the fully mission capable rate standard, right? That standard was a standard when I was in the Air Force back in 1983, right? But we're going back to that standard because we have to, because one thing I think we learned is uh, how many times can you overhaul an actuator, right? How many times can you change a wheel assembly? How many times can you rebuild a brake assembly, right? How many times can you overhaul an engine? At some point in the future, Right, when you look at life cycle management, was that ever planned for? Was it planned to fly the B-52 for 100 years? No. Was it planned to fly the Blackhawk for almost 100 years? No, I could tell you. When you look at industry standards, most hydraulic components are life cycled around 20 years. Most fuel components are the same way. And that maintain, that's maintaining an overhaulable state if they're a time change component, not a fly to fail component. Right, so. When I look at the big three, right, the Black Hawk, the Apaches, Chinook, right, and what is Parker doing to support those, right? We're looking at the sustainability of the platforms, right? And how do we make sure for the next three, five, 10 years in the future that we're do doing what we're supposed to do as a company 
to increase that reliability and focus on all of those illities to make sure the sustainability is met. Right? When you look at certain programs, I'll give you a good example, F-15 stab actuator. I had uh, Colonel Cooper come to me last year and say, Smitty, last year I changed 202 stab actuators at Seymour Johnson. I got 97 from supply. That's pretty astonishing numbers. They cannibalized 105 actuators in one year. And that job takes about eight hours just to take it out. Right, so I look at that sustainability and the non-value added time that we're adding to components over the years because the life cycle was never planned for that. Right, so what are we doing? What is Parker doing? I'm working with the three gentlemen next to me. I'm working with their companies to develop long-term fixes for those platforms. I'm also working with Colonel Atkins and General Gabram and his team to develop technology insertions because some of these products, when you look at UH-60 and you look at all the flight control servo actuators, those are initial design. Right? They haven't been upgraded since 1968. It's initial sealing technology. right? So the same sealing technology that was in your dad's B-52 still being used today. Right? How do we fix sustainability? That's where I think our focus is on the future. One of the things that General McMahon used in a brief years ago when he was a colonel um, was he called it the aging aircraft, the aging military aircraft death spiral. And initially when he put it up there, everybody kind of looked at him and said, boy, it, really, is that what you want to do? You know, throw that out there. But it's true, right? We created this death spiral and now we're augering down. How do we get out of it? Right? And you look at some of the things that are creating this death spiral and sustainability and supportability. Right? It's the basics, corrosion, fatigue, parts availability is critical. The PLTs and the ALTs are consistently growing. Right? What do we do in the future to prevent a 869-day PLT? When on top of it, you got a 180-day ALT. Right? You're at 1,000 days lead time to get a part. That's ridiculous. Right? How do we forecast that better? And it has to be through collaborative forecasting. That has to happen to make things correct. We have multiple partnerships across all of the DOD, and we have a major one down here at CCAD that we're working on. Right? You have to work together right, to support that E4 at 8 o'clock on a Friday night. So why is reliability an issue? I think we just talked about it. Right? Three, five, ten years from now, it's going to be the same platforms the same components, right? Hopefully not the same artisans and hopefully not the same panel 10 years from now. That's what we need to focus on. So who's the voice, of, who's our customer, right? And I look at that, right? And I look at what are the two critical things we need to have, speed and availability, right? So customer support organization, I wanted to consolidate that into one focus, right? The alignment, the benefit, the collaboration, bringing everybody together, right? So that way we can focus hand in hand together to do that collaborative forecasting, that joint networking, right? It's funny because you say, who's your customer? Everybody's my customer. The three gentlemen sitting next to me are my customer. Colonel Atkins, my customer. The senior, or the airman, uh, the uh, E4 on the flight line is my customer. The artisans in the, in the shop are my customer. Right? Jay is my customer. Bob sitting back there from the business office is my customer, right? That's where I think we're, we really need to look at focus and increasing speed and availability, right? So together, it takes a team to win, right? And, and I believe we can get there. And that was it, sir, back okay. to you. Smitty, thank you, thank you. I think we've got a few minutes uh, <coughs> remaining for, uh, for questions. And I think we've got a hand up there, just wait, General Munn will bring a microphone over to you. I've got a quick question while you're walking, General, is what's the wattage of that light bulb? Because I feel for the people that were briefing yesterday. Hey, good morning. Uh, got it. Mark Gonzalez, uh, CCAD. I had a question. I really like that uh, the last Parker slide on the speed. So I can question, barely hear you. I'm sorry. Uh, the question is what are we doing, what are the OEMs, IOB, doing 
to help reduce that PLT. You mentioned the 800 day PLT. Um, to me, that just sounds unacceptable, right? We can machine, we can do anything. Why is it taking so long or what are we doing to reduce that time? Great question. I'll start and if anybody wants to jump in, please feel free. I could tell you what we're doing at Parker. So over the years, you know, we looked at who's our customer, right? And we hold supplier summits and we bring, bring all of our suppliers in and we hold these big, huge summits and I get 200 customers or 200 companies that supply material or parts or a process to Parker and we hold supplier summits annually. And we tell them, look, here's what I need from you. Here's how I need it. Here's how many I need it. And here's when I need it. But have we ever done that with a customer? So I flipped it and I sat down with my vice president and I said, sir, I want to hold a customer summit. And I want to bring the customer in. I want to bring Amcom in. And I'm going to bring the Navy in. I'm going to bring the Air Force in. I'm going to bring DLA in. And we're going to sit down and I'm going to say, here's how I come up with my PLT and ALT and my system. And I'm going to ask them to do the same thing. And we're going to jointly collaborative forecast all of their BEQs for the next five years on major components. And internally, if I could advance fund, a third of those forecasted parts, I just dramatically reduce that lead time. Is it going to happen overnight? No. It's going to take a lot of money for us to do it. Right? But I'm looking at different alternatives, again, outside the box. How do we, Parker, come up with ways to reduce that 859-day lead time for material? Anybody else care to join? I would just kind of add that, that the, the meetings, the monthly meetings we have, the, the joint item management we kind of talked about, I mean, we got to get in front of what the requirement is because, you know, you're right, the system does spit out a, a, a production lead time and, and it always does get kind of, you know, brought in a little bit, but there is some conservatism putting that number because, you know, they, they don't know the order's coming. So I, I really truly believe that, that getting in front of, of what the requirement is you know, is, is the key to that. Because if we know, then, you know, then the supplier knows and, and we're ready for it when that order, and I know we, we've talked about what is the, what, you know, what is CCAD gonna produce in, you know, main gearboxes for the next five years. And I know there's numbers out there, but you know, we need to take those numbers and jointly go over them and understand, and then we'll start taking action through our supply chain to be able to make sure that's there. The issue we have now is that we, we kind of just get the order and then we're, we're sort of reacting. It's what Mr. Marriott described yesterday. It's a reactive process and that's what drives those, those long production lead times. So that's what we gotta get better at as a team, everybody. Uh, I guess I guess I'd like to just add one other point is is uh, as we as we talked about yesterday I mean we're in the process of converting from a just-in-time delivery system to something that's different called strategic depth um, you know the, the system right now and for the past five ten years has been optimized to this just in time so I think it will take some time but to, to his point it's all about the data you know, it's, it's, it's if we can get the data on the table and figure out how to, you know, exactly share between the government industry, the whole supply chain, DLA, you know, that, that's, I think, I think figuring that piece out so that you can, you know, uh, uh, estimate what you're really going to need in the future is, is, is the key. Okay. Lieutenant Colonel Hogan, I think has a question. Good morning, gentlemen. Thanks for your presentation so far. Uh, one question, two parts, part one. Our organization is very interested in utilizing and leveraging business intelligence and that technology. So for your particular OEMs, how much of your data is available to the warfighter now? So if I know when my gearbox is failing based off the HUMS data, can an E4 in my back shop see that data, analyze it, and execute the appropriate repair measures at their level? The second part, all three MDSs we've been flying for decades. So there is historical data on failure rates, time between repair, and component history. Do you have access through ALSA and now ACN of what that looks like over the past 10 or 20 years, which would help facilitate understanding that forecasting requirement? Okay. Mike, do you have, we'll start with you. Well, I, I guess, uh, I guess to, to your point about the you know, onboard data analytics, uh, you know, that's, that's a key area that we're investing in with our, you know, with our independent research and development funds because, you know, I'd say, I'd say 
part of the older system? No, uh, they're not, you know, some of the older gearboxes and, and components are not geared to provide that information, but, but we have been w working really steadily, you know, across all the Boeing platforms, you know, for, for ours to, to get that data. Now we, we do have access to, to some of the maintenance data, but I would say it's, uh, I'd call it suspect only because we know it's incomplete. And so, you know, figuring out how to make, you know, that complete data set so that we did have, you know, we, we certainly try to share our, you know, the historical data we have. We do get some of the other historical data from like the Apache units, for example, but I'd say it's, it's always suspect that it's incomplete. Jay, let me, uh, yeah, for, for the other OEM at yeah, the table I'd, here. I'd say the answer to your question is no. It's a harsh answer, but uh, um, we don't receive HUMS data from the Army. Um, uh, and I, and it, it's, it's a point of concern. We, we brought this up, you know, multiple times. And I, I think that uh, kind of goes to my earlier point on if, you want, if we want to figure out what's causing these things, uh, we, we need to be sharing this, this data because, you know, the, the OEM definitely, I, you know, we believe, you know, in our other platforms, we, we get, like on the Navy side, I mean, we get all, all of their deck plate data, all of their, this is kind of equivalent to holes. Um, we get all of the aircraft sensors that, that, you know, information, we have everything. And so we're able to, to really specifically drive down uh, uh, demand on those components. We're, in, we're able to put together, um, you know, what, what we call, you know, product and process improvements. You know, it could be redesigning a component or it could be a simple maintenance. You know, we found a maintenance procedure was causing damage on a component because we saw like the trend through the data. But we don't receive that data from the Army. And, mm -hmm. uh, and it, it's, we, we believe there could be a lot, a lot to be gained from that um, if we could. Um, we, we get some, and we're brought into some, but it's certainly not the level where we think, I, I think what you're getting at. Um, so I, I just want to kind of address, I think we can pull two questions together to some degree. So understand the theme here about communicating demand and requirements and forecasting them out. So what we have not talked about a lot during this, um, this forum, but I would think that it's something maybe in a future forum, maybe at Cribbins, we need to discuss, is what is sales and operational planning? So this is a Army Materiel Command framework that requires unrestricted demands to be synchronized against supply chain management. And then in the commercial sector, it involves some sales and revenue piece. We're not incorporating that tenet of the framework in Army Materiel Command. But here's the so what to you. It requires us, the LCMCs, to be 24 to 36 months out, laid in an LMP, our demand. So that signal is being consistently amplified out, understanding we're using the systems of record that the Army drives us to use, LMP to ASP and through to our supply chain. But I think that that one's really important because that'll allow us to stop running with scissors every day on spur gears and bevel gears and pinions, our beloved talking points. And I'll go ahead and throw in there our uh, torque tubes since we're all up here talking. But it allows us to stop worrying about those pieces and get us out to 24, 36 months enabling our budget estimate submissions to be correct so that we can actually show you what we're going to have. So what I would offer to you is where I see the, the operationalization of that for the OEMs is through the LTCs. It's the captains of industry contracts. It's the DSPA opportunities and how we're going to evolve our relationship post tells. So what does that mean? How do we use the systems of record that Army Materiel Command is telling us to use understanding the SNOP framework so that you have the forecast that you really need. I, I, we all know every, every OEM up here, we have an enduring relationship with. There is, an, there is nothing going away. It's just how it's going to change, right? You've all made that point and it's, it's, it's driven home. But I would offer that SNOP is something that we, the government, needs to make sure you understand what we're doing with it. I will take that as an action back to talk to my higher headquarters about, but that's the intent. It's 2436 laid into LMP with really the goal being the fight up. Okay, um, the panel is very, very fortunate that I didn't get to ask the question, but you can think about it between now and exactly. Cribbins. But, you know, we're talking about real world problems today. 
And when you think about what you're actually talking about, you're talking about the margin and on the edge. The question is, when you think about it, in future platforms and in future upgrades, okay, how, how are you getting a signal from the government about what's important to change, modify, correct in the support sustainment of future platforms? Because when I look at the releases that are coming out on things like FARA, on Cape Set 3, there's a void there. And unless industry bands together and talks to the government about what your need is, pulling it, and unless the government starts to push it, we're going to build systems that have the same kinds of problems that we're facing today in the future. So thank you very much for a very stimulating panel. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you.